Welcome everyone to the uh, condensed matter slash biological physics seminar and it's a real pleasure to have uh, Dr. Jason Parodi here and we um, lucky to have you here. Nerodi, sorry I mispronounced um, your name already. Um, we actually surprisingly just met today but it felt like I've known you for a long time because just reading at uh, Jasmine's CV and that actually make me feel good because I actually see almost, you know, this kind of hidden unity of the uh, biological physics community. Um, all the names that you have listed on your CV back from your undergraduate to your a couple of years medical school training at BU Medical School and your PhD at UC Berkeley. The people you have worked with is I have actually known or known of them for a long time. Uh, and Jasmine, you have, I guess now I've been spending a few years doing an independent postdoctoral fellowship and a, com a collaboration between the University of Oxford and Rockefeller University in New York. And just look at your CV and, you know, impressive list of publications, but also equally impressive list of, uh, of awards you have garnered. And, you know, going back to what well, this Dutch Mathematical Research Institute master's class, right? It's interesting already. And then you have a um, NSF pre-doctoral fellowship and uh, more Sloan Data Science Fellowship back a few years ago. And then this APS award for outstanding doctoral thesis research. I know this is actually very prestigious because I've written nomination letters for some graduating PhDs. I know it's actually very competitive to get one of those awards. And then um, Jasmine also has a couple of Rising Stars um, award. One um, in physics from you know, MIT, Princeton, um, uh, under this uh, Heisen Simons Foundation. And then uh, last year, when awarded from University of Chicago. So all these awards, it's wonderful to see. Um, so I'm actually very excited. Uh, about your visit and then I look forward to hearing your talk. So now I'll just let you start giving your talk, Jasmine. Uh, let me do the share again. I hope, okay, now it's, it should, it should be showing the, the slides. Is that, is that all, it's all good? Yeah, it looks good. Great, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much for, for the introduction and, and hello everybody. Thanks for, for joining. Uh, I'm, so I'm really excited to tell you all a bit about what I've been working on uh, across scale. So my, my research, like uh, Jay might have hinted at, kind of spans a, a lot of biophysics and it, it centers around the, the movement of organisms through natural environments. And this, is purposefully a broad statement. So along along these lines, I've had a chance to, to work with a bunch of really super fun systems ranging from bacteria to, to arthropods to vertebrates, as well as to look at structure function relationships across several levels of biological organization and from proteins to, to whole organisms. And in, in particular, within, within this kind of broad statement, it's been really important to me to approach biomechanical problems in terms of both the system itself as well as uh, in terms of the, uh, its ecology. So a lot of our physical understanding of biomechanics comes from studies that are done in, in laboratory experiments and laboratory environments. And, and this is totally fair because the laboratory setting is needed for rigor and replication. And, and of course, lab experiments also encompass a lot of my own work. I, I think that to understand biomechanical systems in, in a comprehensive way, we have to take them in context. And so to me, that has always meant attempting to develop an understanding of not just the system itself, the organism itself, but also of its ecology and its evolutionary history and at the interaction between all of these different forces. So this, I think, in, in mechanics is an important consideration, for instance, because locomotion through specific environments and to complete specific behavioral goals is crucial to an organism's survival. 
So the mechanics of, of these locomotive modes can be vastly different depending on the organism that we're thinking about and the, the environment that we're thinking about, even, even towards uh, uh, the same kind of broad goal. So for instance, you know, to find food, bursts of speed and maneuverability on, on flat grassy terrain might be important for large predators. Uh, whereas foraging squirrels, they, they are obviously, you know, over here navigating completely different surroundings. And so perhaps then a little less obvious is, is that a lot of these interactions often are drastically affected by the fact that natural environments that we that that are outside of laboratory settings are unpredictable and, and they can vary on a huge range of time scales. So we're all perhaps very used to the idea that animals have adapted over evolutionary time to be able to move through the environments that they, they evolved in. And, and this is partially why we're all so concerned about the effects of climate or urbanization on biodiversity. But in fact, on shorter timescales, locomotor systems also have to be flexible within, within the lifespan of an organism. So for instance, terrestrial animals that live in tropical areas often have to adapt how they move when the monsoon season hits and their terrain changes from uh, terrestrial to semi-aquatic. And at an even finer time scale, uh, bacteria as well as, as larger animals have to adjust their gates and their movement strategies as they encounter various obstacles and have to move through variable terrain. So, so these adjustments here within the lifespan of an organism can have a huge impact on on their survival. And in this way, I think that mechanics is, is a really great lens through which we can understand some complex and, and abstract concepts in, in biology, like fitness and adaptation. Um, and in, in general, I think for me at least, mechanical intuition has been incredibly valuable in, in my understanding of the natural sciences in general, from understand from studying you know the movement of celestial bodies to to subatomic particles. Uh, the first course that I took in in physics as an undergrad was in mechanics, and I've always thought that, that it's it's such a natural kind of way to start out the formal physics curriculum because it's always been for me at least the lens through which I get an intuition for how uh, a system works, very very broadly speaking. Um, but slightly more specifically, these questions about how organisms can robustly perform mechanical tasks in heterogeneous, unpredictable environments uh, constitutes a huge range of questions across this entire range of time and lens scales. So, for instance, within an organism's lifespan, right, so here, on the time scale of seconds, minutes, hours, months, a few years, uh, they often have to deal with several changes in their environment, whether that be at the, the micro scale when bacteria are transitioning from swimming in our intestinal fluids and burrowing into our gut mucosa or initiating biofilm formation on surfaces that they encounter, or in larger animals dealing with seasonal flooding in tropical regions like these geckos that I mentioned earlier. But uh, when, I, when I say this word adaptive, it's an important word in biology and it's hard to use it without considering some evolutionary implications. And indeed there, there are so many interesting mechanical questions that can be asked about how behavior and body plans and morphologies have been tweaked and optimized over millions of years over here on, on the geological time end of this axis. So additionally, you'll note that I have, I have the size axis corresponding to the characteristic length scale of each system that uh, is on, on this chart. And then the reason that I'm pointing this out specifically is that I want to emphasize that the mechanisms by which bacteria and larger animals that have brains and, and are capable of complex behaviors adjust their mechanical strategies strategies to deal with environmental challenges are, are vastly different, right? So down here uh, with bacteria, we talk about uh, remodeling and, and subunit exchange and modifications in protein structure at the second to minute time scale and uh, evolutions 
uh, evolutionary changes in in protein structure over here in um, at, at the, the, the evolutionary time scale. Whereas with with larger animals, they adjust to their immediate perturbations using flexible behaviors, which in turn will arise from flex flexibilities in, in their underlying neural circuits. And, and in the long term, we see changes in, in large scale morphological features. But for me, so even, even though that these, these kind of systems are, are very mechanistically different, there are some really exciting conceptual ideas that, that tie these systems together, uh, particularly with respect to, I think, how these, these different adaptive strategies, so flexibility within a generation or within an, an individual's lifetime, and genomic evolution over, over many generations relate to each other. Um, and, and to this end, I've had, uh, I've been really lucky to, to have a chance to explore a bunch of interesting systems, right, across, shown across this chart. And I'm noting here, so the work that I've uh, worked on already, I'm, I'm currently working on, or I'm, I'm just beginning or, or planning to do in, in the blue circles here. So, I'll briefly touch on all the, the corners of this chart today, uh, very briefly. But for the main part of my talk, I want to zoom in first on this corner and discuss some work on adaptive mechanics in flagellated bacteria. So this is this, this first red circle here. And in particular, I want to focus on the function of the motor that drives the swimming motility. Uh, which is aptly called the, the bacterial flagellar motor. And when most people think about flagellated swimming, uh, those that often think about it, they immediately kind of might jump to this famous run and tumble system, right? So that's shown here where bacteria uh, initiate a run in a, in a particular direction and then change directions by, by entering a, a tumble that uh, kind of results in this, this random walk. And this is quite a clever way to, to navigate the environment at small scales. And it's a search strategy that I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about more offline or, or later after this talk. But the exciting thing for me about flagellated swimming in bacteria is that flagellated systems show far more diversity beyond this particular behavior. Um, and the reason that I initially became infatuated with bacterial flagella is this, this, this sheer diversity of species that, that utilize these structures and, and furthermore, the diversity of environments that they occupy. So bacteria are just, they're just everywhere and anywhere, right? They, they dominate the world. They're found in our guts, like I mentioned, and they're in the deep sea hydrothermal vents and, and they thrive in all of these vastly, vastly different environments. Um, and while it was this huge diversity that initially sucked me in, this system became, even more appealing to me because I realized that across all of this biodiversity, across all this variation, there's a set of conserved core proteins. And I'm showing them here in these, these images as these solid colored regions. Um, and these shared bits included the two components that are, are crucial for torque generation. So this is the motor's primary function to, to generate torque and to rotate the flagella to propel the bacteria forward in, in its environment. And, and these, these two uh, important parts are the motor's stator shown here in yellow and the, motor, the motor's rotor of which the C ring here is shown in red. And, and this was really exciting particularly to me because it allows us to, to build off of experiments in well-developed model systems, right? Like E. coli, which I'll, I'll mostly talk about today, towards this, this ultimate goal of understanding variation and diversity that exists around this shared core. So, okay, I, I'm gonna dive in a little bit into detail here into the motor structure. Um, the motor consists of three general parts. Uh, a spring-like hook that connects the, the body of the motor here to the flagellar filament, a rotor, which is named as such because it spins with respect to the cell body. It's these concentric protein rings that go through the entire cell wall of the bacterium. And a stator, which is called that because it's stationary in, in the frame of the bacterium. 
So each motor stator consists of several of these MOT units. So MOT here stands for motility. And each of these units connect to the peptidoglycan layer. Um, I should say, please feel free to, to interrupt me at any, any time if anything is, is not clear or anything needs any kind of clarification. Um, okay. uh, so each, each of these units also has an ion channel associated with it. And this ion channel is what allows the motor to use the energy that's stored in the electrochemical gradient across this inner membrane and convert that into torque uh, here at this interface between the MOT units and, and the C ring. So basically what happens is with the passage of each ion, the stator will grab enough energy to make a single power stroke and push the rotor along one step. When I first started thinking about this motor years ago during my PhD, it, it helped me to kind of wrap my mind around all of these moving parts and all of the, the, this complex function by thinking of a, a macroscopic analogy. And in my head, at least, the structure of this, this motor lent itself really nicely to, to that of a, a merry-go-round on the playground. So the rotor is ring-shaped, right? And it's, it's lined with these protein spokes, and that's the merry-go-round itself. And, and we can act as uh, the, the helpful stators that are, that are pushing along this, this merry-go-round to entertain our friends. But one major difference uh, between this merry-go-round and, and the flagellar motor uh, is that we can, we can see the former. We can kind of, we can see a merry-go-round. We can watch our arms reach out. We can grab a spoke and we can spin the wheel. Uh, but the flagellar motor, unfortunately, is a membrane-embedded, multi-protein complex. And getting a really good look at it has long been this huge challenge in, in, in structural biology and, and biophysics. Um, but but despite, despite this slight handicap, so it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're totally helpless, right? It just means that we have to use more indirect ways to develop hypotheses uh, to get at how things at, at the nanoscale are working. And, and one of these tools is designing experiments that, that are getting at uh, characterizing the important biophysical dynamics of, of, a, of a nanoscale system. And for, for molecular motors, for rotary molecular motors at least, a uh, fundamental relation is between the motor torque, shown here on the y-axis, and the rotation speed of the motor. So like a merry-go-round, the BFM can go at, at a wide range of speeds. And, and this is shown here in this data that was collected by the Berg Lab at Harvard. And the way that these experiments are performed is you immobilize a bacterium on a microscope slide and you stick them down by their cell bodies. So in addition to sticking them down, we also have sheared off their flagellar filaments and replaced it with a bead. And, and we do this because it's easy to directly observe the speed of rotation of a bead by using high speed video or, or by using a feedback optical trap if we want to be more precise. And, and from here, because we're at, at a very low Reynolds number, so the, the largest um, bead I use is about one micron in diameter, we can get out the torque that's generated by the motor to rotate a bead of a given radius r at some rotational speed omega. And we can, we can make measurements across, across this entire curve depending on our bead size. And so these dynamic experiments in, in combination with what we do know about the motor structurally allow us to make clear hypotheses for how the flagellar motor functions. Um, and excitedly, we're getting higher and higher resolution structures of the motor components these days, which then is now kind of allowing us to create better and better, more predictive models. Um, so in this way, we cast our predicted motor dynamics in the form of, of three Langevin equations. So one is for the motion of the stator units. This applies torque to and then feels a reaction torque back from the rotor. And the rotor then uh, exerts a torque on, um, onto the, to rotate the load via this flexible hook connection. 
And the external load for, for a real life flagella in a, in a real bacteria swimming around is the flagella filament beating against some fluid. But uh, for our experimental system, right, so where all our measurements are made and all the measurements that we use and see in the literature, uh, it largely consists, the load will consist of a bead, like I mentioned. So that's rotating at, at some, some rotational speed. Um, and, and so each of these equations I'll note is, is a torque balance. So the drag is here on the, on the left. So if you remember, we're, we're at very low Reynolds number. So the, the left hand here is, is just a viscous term. Okay, so one important prediction that we were able to make using this model was that the torque speed relationship would be defined by two time scales. And I'm showing here a, a simulated trace for the angular position of the rotor with time. And so that you see this two-step repetitive cycle as that was predicted by our model. So there is a phase where the motor is actively rotating and generating torque, this moving time Tm, and a phase where it's waiting in between steps for the next ion to arrive and give it some energy, this, this waiting time Tw. Um, if you go back to the, the merry-go-round analogy, this is kind of how we would, we would pause to take a breath after a big push on a, on a roundabout slope. Okay, um, and, and these two time scales they map really nicely on, onto this data. So over here, when the external load is high, the motor takes a longer time to complete a power stroke because it's harder to push something that's, that's very heavy and it takes longer. So the moving time dominates the cycle. But as the load gets lower, the waiting time, which remember, uh, depends only on ion arrival. So it only depends on ion concentration and doesn't get lower with decreasing applied load like the moving time would, it takes over and the motor becomes kinetically limited in the low torque regime. So I mentioned this several times, but biomechanical systems, I like to consider them in, in their natural environments that they're functioning in. So I've shown you all this data, but the question is, how, how relevant is this plot to bacteria that are swimming around in the real world, living their lives, not being manipulated by, by me in the lab? Um, and, and luckily the answer is that it is, it's very relevant. So this whole curve pretty accurately represents the, the functional range of the motor for, for freely behaving bacteria, uh, which actually lead you know, quite complicated and exciting lives, I think. Uh, so for instance, when, uh, when a bacteria is uh, freely swimming on its own in fluid, it lives um, over here in, in this low torque, high speed region. And this is because flagellar filaments are thin and they don't impart much torque onto the motor in, in fluid. But when bacteria interact with surfaces or with other bacteria in a, in a swarm, they shoot up here into the high torque region. And, and an important thing additionally is that a lot of bacteria, uh, including and gut bacteria like E. coli, not only have to deal with, with both of these environments, but they often have to be able to transition between them quickly. Um, and then their flagellar apparatus has to be equipped to, to make these transitions. So how, 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 how do the, does it manage to do this? Um, so to, to get at this, Let's let's go back to the, the playground and think about how we might deal with these kind of switches there. Uh, so let's say that our best friend wants, wants a push on the merry-go-round. So this is not too challenging. We can make the merry-go-round go fast. It doesn't make us too tired. And, and everyone involved can have a lot of fun. But once everyone on the playground starts seeing how much fun this act actually is, maybe they all start to want to join in. And at this point, the required torque for spinning gets higher and higher and higher, uh, and it gets a lot more difficult. So eventually, perhaps you want to recruit some of your friends to, to help shoulder some of the effort. Um, and it turns out that that's exactly what the flagellar motor does. So. It was observed in E. coli that motors that operate here at high load have far more stator units gathered around its periphery than motors here at low load. But we had no idea how this transition happens and what the dynamics of this transition are. So how do you decide when to call your friends over? How do they decide when they should come over and help and how long they should stay? 
Um, and so this, this exactly broadly is what I pushed to answer during my postdoctoral work at Oxford um, in particular. So I focused on, on three specific questions. First, so what are the environmental factors that drive remodeling in the flagellar motor? And, and what does this remodeling actually entail at the molecular level? Um, and finally, and, and to me, this will come up again and again, I think in, in my work that the most interesting aspect is, is the time scale. So on what time scale does this remodeling happen? Do, do bacteria adapt quickly within a single generation as they're transitioning between different lifestyles? Or do they adapt across generations so that their, their progeny can live better, more efficient lives? Um, and to, to start off, I constructed a model of stator engagement and disengagement to the rotor. So characterized by an arrival rate K on and a disengagement rate K off. And the question that I aimed to answer concretely was, is the arrival rate, the leaving rate, or both sensitive to environmental factors? And, and like I mentioned, Bacteria are swimming in between fluids of different viscosities. They're interacting with, with mucus. They interact with other bacteria. They interact with surfaces. And all of these interactions are greatly affecting the load that the motor experiences, the external load. So for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on testing the dependence of these rates on, on the external load that is felt by, by, the, by the motor. And so... The way that we can get at this is by using the bead assay that I described before. So we can get a picture of what a motor is doing at a particular load on this curve here noted by this, by this red bar. And the position of that point is determined by which size bead we use. So if we were to use a smaller bead, we move towards the lower load region. And by using a bigger bead, we can get closer to, to stalling the motor at high loads. But Still, each of these points is giving us a, a very static picture of what's going on. It's not giving us any insight into, into this dynamic nature of motor behavior as bacteria are moving across this curve, uh, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So to deal with this, we made a modification of the bead assay. So instead of using plain polystyrene beads, I used uh, super paramagnetic beads. And this allows us to manipulate and perturb what a bacterium feels by using an external magnetic field. So for this, we use first two mounted permanent magnets that exert some torque on the bead. And, and for this experiment, we lowered the magnets at a height so that the external magnetic torque on the bead exactly canceled out the motor torque. And so the motor is stalled at, at zero speed. So before the application of, of this external forcing, you can see that the population average of motors is spinning along here with a fixed number of states. And when we lower the magnets and we keep them there for five minutes, you can see that once we raise the magnets so the motor is spinning on its own again, that during this period where we applied a lot of torque, the, stator, the number of stator units on average jumps up, indicating that the motor went to underwent some remodeling during this time. Right? And then once that torque is removed, the motor again relaxes back to its original state or its original state or number for, for this bead size. And from this relaxation process, we can get out the characteristic time and the steady state state or number, which we can then plug into that kinetic model that I described earlier to get out some idea of what these engagement and disengagement rates might be. And so we repeat this across different bead sizes and across many bacteria, which allows us to get at how these rates in our model might look as we move across this curve. So when we have the magnets, they pull us over here to, to the stall torque at zero speed. And then once the beads are released, the relaxation processes take us to these various points here on the right, each of which is determined by the bead size. But the issue was that we couldn't quite access this low torque region using this experiment uh, based on the, the smallest commercial bead sizes that were available to us. And, and this, this was a huge obstacle because like I mentioned, so performance along this whole range is important for a bacterium that's, that's living its life. 
And, and this is a particularly dynamic region where you see this huge drop in torque. So, okay, we had to have a, a bit of a think and we realized that, okay, using permanent magnets, we're able to go in, in this direction and then relax to various points on the curve, which make us totally dependent on the bead size. But what if instead of using a permanent magnet, which can only stall the motor, we used a rotating magnetic field, which we could then spin at any speed, which forces the bead and the motor to then follow along at that same speed. That would be able to take us all along this curve, really in either direction that we wanted to go. And luckily this you know, includes the low torque section. So th this, was, this was exciting to me because it gave us access to, to the entire range, but additionally, I was specifically excited because it allows us to test the effects of a wide ranges of speeds and loads on a single bacterium. So we can watch many different transitions in the same cell, which takes away a lot of the intracellular cell to cell variability that we had to deal with when we were dealing with these population averages. And so now on the, on the right here, I'm showing the trace from a single motor instead of an average across a ton of bacteria. So here you can see that the motor is moving along happily at, at some speed, 45 hertz, without any interference from us. So this is before the magnet has been turned on. And then we turn the magnet on and, and the speed jumps up to 200 hertz because that's the, the speed that the, that the external field is, is going at in this particular trial. And then we turn it off to see how the bacterium is doing. You see that there's already some remodeling going on. The speed has fallen a bit from baseline. And we do this again and so on until we get some time courses for how stator units are behaving at a particular load or speed. And I repeated this across many different loads and across many different bacteria to, to get out the parameters that allow us to then calculate on and off rates across this whole curve. And putting all of this together, what we found was that the on rate shown here in blue wasn't dependent on external conditions, but the off rate shown here in red decreased as external load increased. So basically stator units were coming by to check on their hardworking friends regularly, despite how tough the job of pushing along the rotor was. But if they came by and they see that they're needed, then they stay for a bit longer. So this, this kind of bond where the, it goes, grows stronger with larger external force is called a catch bond. And this, this, this is actually shown to be a pretty popular strategy uh, for mechanosensation in, in a range of molecular systems, including um, adhesion in bacteria, leukocyte adhesion, and as well as in, in a lot of actomyosin systems. Um, but because I, I am particularly fond of macroscopic analogies, it's also familiar to us on, on the macroscopic scale. So, so if, we, if we remember as, as kids getting these, these finger traps in, in our holiday stocking, so you would put your fingers in and if you panic and you tried to get them out, you'd find that the tube tightens, right? And an escape becomes impossible. Um, and the, the only way to, to actually get out is to, to just relax and apply less force letting the bond go slack. So this is a strategy that uh, the flagellar motor has, has also learned, but over, over millions of years. Okay, so like, like I mentioned, uh, probably several times over now, the, this idea of time scale is, is always one of the most interesting aspects to these lines of questions for me. Uh, and for me, it was really exciting to see that the flagellar motor remodels itself within, within a bacterium's lifespan, so within seconds to minutes uh, in response to changes in the environment. And, and like I mentioned, this is particularly salient and poignant for me because flagella are, are crucial to many aspects of a bacterium's life. So like swimming in, in various fluids, for instance, using run and tumble dynamics that I, that I mentioned earlier, the statistics of this search strategy are sensitive to flagellar number and flagellar morphology in, in many ways, um, as is forming biofilms on, on various surfaces that they encounter. So I'm showing here on, on the right, a biofilm that was made by a non-flagellated mutant of Pseudomonas aeruginosa compa compared to one here made by the wild type. So it's clear that flagellated motility plays quite a role, a uh, vital role, in, in shaping biofilm growth and, and structure 
across across the species, but we don't know much about the dynamics of that role in in regulating biofilm uh, growth. And I'd be more than happy to talk about any of any of these projects more offline. But uh, given that I promised you a, a tale of two motilities, I will shift now up this scale to, to talk about adaptive mechanics in, in larger animals. Uh, but before, before I do so, I just wanted to pause to, to see if there are any questions on, on the bacterial work, or we can take everything at the end, but, but I just wanted to do a bit of a pause before I shift gears. Okay, um, so like I mentioned at the, the start of this talk, as we move up in complexity, the, the adaptive strategies that organisms use change. Single cells can rely on, on modifying the structure of a few proteins to have an effect on their mechanical interactions right, with the world around them. And, and when we think about these kind of flexibilities in larger animals, we, we have to think about behavior. So for instance, variation in, in kinematic strategies and uh, accordingly in the underlying neural circuits that are controlling them. So one exciting example that I like of this comes from animals that live in tropical regions, which I've mentioned a couple of times that, that periodically flood. So for instance, geckos, are fast runners on land and, and their lifestyle really needs them to be. They have to, to run away from predators and they have to catch food that is, that is fast. Um, and, and when the monsoon season arrives, this doesn't change, even though the, the environment that they're moving through has changed completely from terrestrial to, to semi-aquatic. And so we first observed how they dealt with this in, in the field. So this is video taken by um, Artie and Giuseppe at the Wildlife Reserve in Singapore. And, and what struck us first off was how, how fast these guys were in semi-aquatic environments. So this is, this is real time. And once it slowed down, we also took note of the fact that the kinematics were very, very different from what we would think of uh, in normal swimming. So the gecko's bodies and limbs are raised far above the water surfaces, more than we would expect from surface swimming. And so we got a bit more data and we realized that the, these guys didn't just look like they were going very fast to our eye, but they were in fact going as fast through water as they were running on land. So their, their speeds were indistinguishable from each other. And, and so if you've ever you know, taken swimming or, or water, which this is a pretty big feat, right? Water imparts a good deal more drag on us than air does. Um, and I'm doing the, the fast version just one more time because it's fun. Okay, so water walking exists, right? Across the animal kingdom in, in a whole range of species. And there's this, this comprehensive chart from, from uh, Who and Bush's uh, review that shows this. Uh, so on the X and the Y axis here are, are two non-dimensionalized quantities, the, the Weber number here and the bond or Etwish number here. So the, the Weber number is the ratio of gravitational or inertial forces versus surface tension forces, whereas the, the bond number compares buoyant and surface tension forces. So when both of these numbers are small, the, the contribution of surface tension is, is high. So small animals like insects or spiders and, and some small lizards can rely on this to just keep them on the surface. But as we move up this, this line and animals get larger and larger, it becomes harder to passively keep your head above water. And so one now has to generate enough impulse to provide support for, for a week. And this, this comes in the form usually of uh, something called surface lapping, which is a a mode that was made popular by the basilisk lizard a few years ago. But the thing with the geckos that we had observed was that they were much smaller by, by an order or more of magnitude than the basilisk. And they also seemed too large to, to rely on surface tension. So they kind of fell right in between these, these two regimes. Uh, and so this is where we decided to design a more controlled study in the lab. So, we got some of these geckos and we built a custom setup to study this behavior in, in the lab. And this consisted of a water tank 
with the size laser cut out and a ramp leading up to it. Uh, and the ramp was important because geckos only like performing this behavior when they absolutely have to. So it's energetically costly and getting them to run across the water either requires prey running away from them or something chasing them. Uh, and we simulated the latter by, by touching their tails while they were on the ramp to, to spook them. So we set up these, these high-speed cameras to film our trials, and then we implemented various uh, video and image analysis tools to quantify features of their kinematics. And what we saw was a behavior that was markedly similar to, to the surface slapping behavior that, that was characterized in basilisks. For instance, their limbs were raised high above the water surface, much more than in, in normal swimming and just like we had seen in, in the field. But when we calculated the contribution of this behavior to the impulse that was needed to maintain their body above the water surface, we found that it was only about 10% uh, contribution, which, which is way less than the amount of their body that we observed about, uh, about the water. And, and so, so we, had to, we knew that there had to be something, something more going on there. And so we turned to the other side of this graph. Uh, we use a small amount of surfactant to reduce the surface tension in the water uh, by about a half to see how it might contribute. And as, as you can see, it really seemed to make a huge difference. So the guy in the surfactant condition still hasn't finished the race, right? And this was initially quite surprising to us because we had expected that these geckos were a bit too large for surface tension to make at least this much of a difference. Um, and our calculations seem to confirm this. So the amount of surfactant we added shouldn't have even reduced surface tension by that much of a huge amount. And so we thought perhaps they don't like the soap somehow and the, the, they're changing their behavior or their kinematics in some way in the soapy water. But, but they weren't. Their contribution from surface slapping was, was just as strong as ever. But indeed, we, we measure a huge drop in, in head height above the water surface between the two conditions, and, and accordingly, a huge reduction in forward speed, which you would expect given the additional drag on the body of the animal. So at first, we, we weren't really sure why. Uh, but then we realized that, that many species of geckos have uh, adaptations on their skin in particular that tend to give them these a lot of their kind of locomotive superpowers, climbing up walls, walking upside down. Um, and so we ended up testing the, the material properties of our geckos uh, using so water droplets and, and a high resolution camera. And we found that the skin on, on their entire ventral surface, so their entire underbelly, not just their palms, was super hydrophobic. And, and this, was, this was a really kind of, aha, nice, nice uh, revelation because it explained both the increased contribution of, of surface tension forces in the pure water condition, as well as how catastrophic adding any bit of surfactant was on their ability to remain de-wetted and, and as such remain above the water. So in this way, these geckos were able to, to utilize both changes in their kinematic strategy, so over here on, on this end of the time scale, as, as well as evolved traits like the, the super hydrophobicity of their belly skin over here on this end of the time scale uh, to adapt to seasonal fluctuations in, in their environment. And so this in this way, this project was really special for me because it the super clear kind of integration across, across this entire time range. Um, and importantly, it also highlighted to me that even though you know, locomotion in bacteria and, and animals like geckos are, are completely different problems mechanistically. There are these kind of universal conceptual questions that tie all of these biomechanical systems that I, that I love so much all together. So, okay, on, on that note, I think I have a bit of time left and I'm, I'm happy about that because I wanted to slightly amend the title of this talk to tell you about some recent work that I've been really excited about on, on walking in, in tardigrades. Um, and to me, so tardigrades were this really insightful system to, to work on mechanistically because they, they exist at several rare environmental extremes, right? So they're among the smallest known animals with legs, as well as one of the only soft-bodied walkers. And, and the latter was 
uh, stood out to me specifically because understanding soft body lo locomotion is, is so, so, so challenging. Um, okay, why, why is that? So I think this, and this is my, my uh, assessment of it, is that some of the most important insights into multi-legged locomotion comes from getting data on individual leg kinematics. And so I'm showing here an imaging setup developed in, in Drosophila. So from a setup like this, we can get out various kinematic factors like step length or stride period, as well as measure relative interlimb coordinations. And, and this is possible largely because we have these discrete contact points. We have the tips of the legs and we can see them and track their, their motion. Um, but in soft body crawlers like earthworms or, or, or nematodes, it's really hard to get out similar measurements because there's not these kind of neat, discrete contact points that, that we can use uh, to quantify some stepping or coordination patterns or ground reaction forces. There, there was once upon a time where I tried to get out similar data on snakes using serp uh, in serpentine locomotion. And so here uh, we ended up using uh, photoelastic gelatin with two cross polarizers to see where they were pushing down. And, and we were only able to get out qualitative data like this, but even, even this was exceedingly, exceedingly difficult. Um, so in this way, tardigrades, I think, have provided this really wonderful porthole into understanding control and mechanics in, in soft systems. So much like the, the flash setup that I showed on the last slide, we filmed tardigrades with this high-speed camera walking along an agarose gel. And the substrate properties of this agarose gel, we could control them rigorously because we could control the gel fraction. And, and these videos are shown from top and side views on a gel of stiffness about 50 kilopascals. So once we had the setup up and running, that would allow us to get out kinematic information. We found that tardigrades actually walked in a very regular and coordinated pattern. Uh, and this in, it, in itself was super surprising to us because of the small size of their, their nervous system. We were initially pretty unsure if such small circuits could robustly control the many degrees of freedom involved in, in, soft, in soft body locomotion. But we found that they walk really consistently with a tetrapod-like pattern. And, and this is called as such because the diagonal legs swing off together in sets of two, leaving four legs, a tetrapod, on the ground. So you can see here, these two legs have taken off and these four on the ground. Um, and we measured the relative timing between contralateral leg pairs, so legs that were directly across from each other, and ipsilateral leg pairs. So these are leg pairs that are directly anterior and posterior neighbors. And we found that tardigrades maintained this tetrapod-like coordination pattern uh, with an ipsilateral phase offset of about one third and an antiphase contralateral coordination, so alternating stepping across all the walking speeds that we measured. Um, and this was striking because beyond just being consistent within tardigrades, these patterns were strikingly similar to those that were seen in other arthropod species. And in particular, we were able to utilize uh, recent studies in Drosophila that generated this massive kinematic data set, which showed that walking patterns across speeds in flies has a, a low dimensional manifold structure, which we observed the patterns in tardigrades map really nicely onto. And to generate this range of patterns, we can propose a simple underlying generating circuit. So this is based on the structure of the tardigrade nervous system and the, and, and the arthropod nervous system. And this circuit consists of mutual inhibition between contralateral legs and a back to front inhibitory circuit going up each ipsilateral side. And, and this idea of a simple underlying system that can generate this huge range of patterns that allow organisms across a lot, a, a huge range of length scales, a huge diversity of skeletal structures, and the huge diversity of environments is, is, is remarkable. And just like for me, developing a, a model for fundamental torque generation in, in the flagellar motor 
started me off in this mission of tackling the diversity that is seen across bacteria, I have this hope that this generalizable simple model can then be tweaked to start thinking about various problems in control, scaling, flexibility of walking kinematics uh, in, across the super, super diverse group of arthropods, which include, you know, insects and, and uh, myriapods like centipedes and millipedes and, and their close relatives like tardigrades. Okay, so I, I'll stop there now. And I just want to thank some of the, the places that have supported my work, as well as some of the people that I've been really lucky to, to work alongside and collaborate with. And so each person is here accompanied next to their, their favorite organism. Uh, so thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Nice, fascinating creatures. <laughs> Let's open the floor for questions for Jasmine. A relative small audience, I guess you can just unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Hello. Yeah, um, hi, Jasmine. Uh, wonderfully engaging talk. I don't normally hear about um, any of these topics. Uh, but so one thing, one connection that I made between the environments that the flagellar motors and the geckos might be in are the amount of salt in whatever environment they're in. Um, mm -hmm. And so I know that salt affects these the solubility of like hydrophobic molecules. I don't know how that would extend to the case of the gecko. Um, and the ions are also involved in the mechanism of the flagellar motor. So I was wondering, do you have any comments on what role um, ions might play in, in those mechanisms? Certainly for the flagellar motor, ions play a huge role because they're the, the energy source, right? So we, we uh, I didn't show this data, but we did this test in a range of ionic environments. So in a, a range of uh, possible IMFs. And we did this both by very, uh, both in proton driven motors by changing the, the pH and in sodium driven motors by changing the sodium concentration. And what we hypothesize and our results are consistent with this, but it needs kind of further testing in, in more rigorous ways is that IMF works and ion concentration works via external load to, to control a remodeling. So it, it's consistent with, when you, when you change the IMF, you change the energy of each power strip, right? So the, the torque speed curve changes in, in different ion concentration. So what we found in remodeling dynamics is that it, the remodeling is dependent on the torque per state, torque felt per stator, and they kind of, they all collapse onto each other. As for the geckos, I'm 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 not sure because we didn't we only tried them in fresh water. They the, the, the monsoons happen and the the rain is and the puddles that they move through are generally fresh water, so we didn't try them in in, in salt water. Okay, thank so you. What about surfactant, Jasmine? You mentioned what, if you threw some detergent surfactant on it, would they actually stop being able to walk and yeah. drown? So they, they switch, so the, the video that I showed was with, with a bit of surfactant, right? So they lose their ability to remain de-wetted. And so the, the super hydrophobicity go, goes away and then they have to resort to the standard swimming behavior. So they go much slower and they're unable to support their, their body weight above the, the water. So they go much, much, much slower. And if they have, they were, it was an interesting behavioral thing that we saw was when we initiated these experiments, we would do that, do it by eliciting a panic response in them, right? Because otherwise this is a very energetically taxing mode and they don't like doing it. So they prefer to just swim, um, but we scared them and they would get into the water and, and try to do this, this mode. And when they realized that they, they were unable to, and they had to swim, a lot of them would just give up and sink down to the bottom and and just wait. I, I think they were, it was it was more of a kind of hiding mechanism rather than anything. But then we would just fish them out because we didn't want them to drown. Hi, Jasmine. I, I, I enjoyed your talk a lot. Um, I. You know, you scared the gecko yes. to get to get, you know, and, and you're pretty, yeah. You scared the gecko to get the, the gecko to cross the water. And 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 then you start talking about behavior. 
uh, of the of the gecko also and fear um and the tardic do the tardigrades uh behave uh how do you get them to move and and at what length scale do animals start behaving so this this idea of what is what is behavior is 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 a is a is a very is contentious one, I guess. I mean, I, I have my ideas on what I think behavior is and, and I think bacteria have behavior uh, because they, they interact with their environment and they sense various things and, and they're doing it. I don't think that you need neural systems to, to have behavior, but tardigrades definitely do um, respond to various things in their environment and, and definitely change their, their dynamics. And this is also some data that I didn't show, but when we change their substrate stiffness, they change their, that's the only time we see them diverge from this coordination pattern that they have. So we do have some ideas about what flexibilities might be needed in the circuit to, to move across different terrains. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for a terrific talk. Um, a question about the geckos. So did you have a chance to look at other geckos or closely related animals to see if their skin was similarly hydrophobic? It's something we're really keen on doing. We haven't. Um, interestingly, super hydrophobicity has been characterized in, in other gecko species, but on, on the back in certain clades. And, and that's uh, hypothesized because of, of, of protection from rain, but uh, we see it on the ventral side and whether the kind of mo the molecular scale, the micro scale mechanisms by which hydrophobicity is conferred is the same in these two is, is unclear, we don't know. And, and yes, I'm super excited about seeing. All questions? I may have more questions in my mind, but I'll ask later. <laughs> people have <laughs> on the audience to uh, raise more questions about three different type of species. You didn't mention that Jesus can walk on water. Yes. So <laughs> the, the, the basilisk lizard, when they first found that it uh, did this water running, the, all the newspapers were calling it the Jesus lizard. <laughs> it was a joke. It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, the, this, this was a, a very popular joke, I think, with the... Others. <laughs> Great. Um, there are no um, questions here at the moment. I think I'm going to stop the recording, okay? Oh, yes, that sounds good. Mm -hmm.